This is Rumble, and I'm Michael Moore. My guest today is none other than Keith Oberman. Uh, We're so glad to have Keith back in the political arena, uh, though we love him in both. Uh, Keith is, is one of America's most beloved and entertaining sports broadcasters, I mean, of all time. Uh, he helped revolutionize ESPN Sports Center with his wit and his brilliant writing, his mischievous hijinks. Um, and then he was the longtime host of MSNBC's Countdown with Keith Oberman. Uh, we all remember that show every night at eight o'clock as Keith, with especially with his what he called his special comments, uh, eviscerated the lies in the propaganda of the Bush administration, and especially during uh, the Iraq war. After a return trip to sports at ESPN, he now has just departed ESPN again uh, just earlier this month to get back into the foxhole and share his commentary on Trump and the election every weeknight at 5 p.m. Eastern time on a YouTube show called Worst person in the world. Um, <laughs> I was I was tempted to go worst person in the world because uh, you can't read those words. <laughs> you can't read those words now without hearing your voice uh, like that. Uh, but listen, everybody, you can subscribe for free. This is a free show every day at five p.m. Eastern on Keith's uh, YouTube channel. Just go to the Keith Olbermann YouTube channel. But today, right now, he's here with me on Rumble. Welcome, Keith, to my podcast. Thank you, Michael. It's good to be with you. Um, I wish it were, as they say, I wish it were under more pleasant circumstances, like we were dancing on Broadway or debuting a new show or something. But <laughs> yes, you also, you also, I, each night on Broadway, um, I would have a special surprise guest and, and you were there. Not, actually, I, I think you were the only one I asked back yeah. a, for a second because the conversation with you was so incredible. And then and, and the fact that you did your – to explain to people, there were, at the end of the show, there was a special thing that happened that included dancing. And uh, that you brought a special, like, dance coat. I don't, I, I don't know how to, how to describe it, but it was just like – so much thought went into this and it just, it, it, I thought this is exactly how he is. This is how he is when it was on sports center. He's on sports center. This is how he is on M- on his MSNBC show. Well, you know, the drill, if you're going to do it, do it. I mean, if you're going to jump off the end of the pier, <laughs> yes. leap up in the air first and maybe, you know, and wear a, some sort of like pink dinner jacket, which is what I had on. So. <laughs> I just want to repeat that, that uh, 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 what you just said for uh, younger people in the audience uh, to take the risks th- that there's a piece of your brain that's telling you, don't do it, don't, don't do it. And then there's the other piece of your brain that's going, screw it. Come on, come on. You only live once and <clears throat> you live your life that way. I have to tell you though, during this last year, you know, I was really hoping, hoping, hoping we would hear from you. And I know it's not up to anybody else what you want to do with your life. And, and you know, you were happy uh, being back at uh, ESPN. And, of course, you know, those who love sports love you in that arena. But as this was becoming clearer and clearer that this wasn't going to be an ordinary election, that we have somebody who has no intention of leaving. Yeah. And that's not just me saying that or you saying that he's made it very clear that he's not leaving so when you announced earlier um this month basically what are we in now we're we're in the second half of the month already so that you were coming back oh man uh a collective cheer i think went across the country and now and so i've been watching uh your show uh every uh, late afternoon and um you are not pulling any punches sir uh <laughs> you have really gone for it and you were saying the things that that i don't know if you could say them if you were on cable news i don't know maybe you could these days but yeah i i, I, I think i think your assessment might be correct and it's it's one of the, there's there's the delay in my coming back which i'd like to apologize for again was several things that had a little 
different structure to them uh, fell through. Uh, I, I've been trying to do something like this. I, I guess the the first in conclusion that I needed to do something was you know maybe late last year, and stuff just didn't happen. And things that were supposed to happen in the pandemic played a part. And I'm not obviously equating this as something important to that. But finally, at some point, I just I knew that if if none of these other things panned out, what I would do is simply leave ESPN and go independent. And one of the more extraordinary things that I have found was as writing, writing these scripts and reading them and recording them is that <laughs> there have been moments where I'm going, well, somebody's going to react to that. Wait a minute. Nobody's going to react to that. I am independent. It doesn't, <laughs> I can do whatever I want. And once again, that rule applies. If you're going to jump off the pier, do it, you know, leap upwards first. And, and yeah, it's, there's a, there's a freedom to, to that, that I don't think is, available anywhere else, maybe in your work, uh, but on a, on a kind of daily basis where you just go out and react to the news as it happens and say the truth, because as I've always, you know, we've discussed this before, nothing has ever been resolved. No problem in mankind's history has ever been resolved without somebody first saying, this is wrong. We have to fix it. I may not know how to fix it, but I'm the one who sits there yelling, this is wrong. And that's what I'm trying to do every day. And right out of the gate, uh, you called Trump a terrorist. Well, he is. And, and, well, explain explain that. But there, there, there might be some argument as to whether he is simply, you know, quote terrorist unquote. But there is no doubt he he literally fits the definition of stochastic terrorism. And stochastic is a nice technical term for terrorism by proxy for uh, the medieval. British king saying, who will rid me of this meddlesome priest? And the next day, four of his guys run the guy through with a sword. That's a stochastic terrorist. And if you say, liberate Michigan, and 14 guys wind up get a, getting arrested, having done recon on the summer home of the governor of, of Michigan, uh, you mm -hmm. have, you know, and they happen to be supporters of yours. They happen to have led, left a trail a mile wide of their political beliefs. That's stochastic terrorism. If you say, go kill somebody. Um, that's stochastic terrorism, particularly if somebody gets killed and right. it, it's cause and effect. And it is a well-established legal principle. It's a historical truth dating back millennia that you can be a terrorist by proxy. And we, you know, we can then go to the other definitions of terrorism, which is what is he telling his own supporters about this election? Biden right. will burn down your suburbs and, open, erase the borders and they'll, you know, you won't be allowed to have wood again. And all, I mean, whatever else, burn down the cities, all the rest of that stuff is just using not just actual violence, but the threat of it to attain political outcomes. That's the definition of terrorism. And that, that people will not say, this was true in the 2015, 16 campaign and people wouldn't say it then. Mm -hmm. And it's still right. true. And people particularly on television will not say it because the meetings they they may not fire you, but the meetings will, will will destroy your day and you'll never get back on the air again because you have to keep going to meetings explaining what it is you meant. So I would right. I would literally say I'm not being exaggerative about this. No, no. And I didn't have and I did not get a full meeting with my publicist Mitt Romney to discuss this term <laughs> terrorist, but uh, I was I thought it was very nice of Mitt to include that in his little his little statement of yes. Yeah, tell, uh, tell people about that. It, you did a, you you did an episode on Mitt the Enabler, um, but uh, explain that to the people. Listening. Well, yeah, this was this was. I mean, you know, you, you sit there and you wonder when you start something like this. Okay, it's been a couple of years. Every couple of years nowadays, the media landscape changes. The political landscape changes faster than that now. Um, it's one of the hidden advantages that that Joe has in this election that people are exhausted by this. They'd like to be able to go a day without wondering what the goddamn president did this time. Um, but the, the, the Romney thing was on the third day of this series or the four, no, excuse me, it was a week ago. I'd done four of them. And in the first one, I, I'm declared just as I did to you and explained what stochastic terrorism is and the other aspects that, that makes me fear, make me feel comfortable calling Trump a terrorist per se. Uh, and he came out with a statement of conscience about how bad political discourse had gotten like that just happened rather than having started in 1990. And he complained about, you know, the terms without saying Trump's name, he described the, the, some of the terms he used and uh, the other candidate while not stooping to that level, his democratic uh, colleagues have said this and Pelosi ripped up his speech and Keith Olbermann called him a terrorist. And I was like, 
wait a minute, I'm missing something here. How did I get to be in the list with Trump and Biden and Pelosi? I mean, the fourth name on that list is not Keith Olbermann. If he had said <laughs> Steny Hoyer, I would have said, well, I think you got it wrong, but okay, that makes sense. I'm not an elected official. Uh, if nominated, I will not run. And if elected, I will not serve. And the, the idea that he had to go to me as an example of rhetoric that he thought was as whatever as Trump's rhetoric is, was just uh, was the authentication of my latest project that I did not have to that point. So on day by day four, I had completely pissed off Mitt Romney. So the whole <laughs> thing has been a success in its <laughs> execution. Now, we want obviously a, a, a final result to be success more importantly than anything else. But so far, if Mitt Romney is pissed off at you, you're doing well. What is that final uh, result? I mean, what is that going to be? Um, I'm not asking you for a prediction. Yeah. I just, I, I want to just, I, w- I want to point out just before we leave the Trump is terrorist yeah. thinking here that um, you're right. Historically, some of the great, great uh, terrorists, uh, you know, some of the most sick and disgusting terrorists never killed a single person. Right. You know? Osama bin Laden never right. killed anybody himself. Right. Um, Manson didn't kill anybody. I don't believe, yeah, I don't believe there's any, I don't believe there's any record of Hitler personally killing anybody. And, and, you know, hundreds of millions of people died because of Hitler. And it would be the least of the things you could call Hitler would be terrorist. But he, that, that uh, certainly that applies to that. Um, and I so mean, you, it, you, you have all varieties you have all yeah. varieties here of this kind of, of terrorist by proxy. But, um, but what, especially what he continues to do to the governor of Michigan, yes, Sunday. Um, he is really calling out to people to please, please remove this woman uh, from our site. That woman, as he calls her. Yes. Um, as he said about Hillary Clinton in 2016, maybe my second amendment people can take care of her. That's correct. What does, what exactly did that mean? I mean, that's like, it, it, sometimes it is so simple, but the words are so weighted that you're worried about the consequences of saying the words. The first way to resolve this is to say the words. Um, he's criminally negligent in the deaths of at least 200,000 Americans with more to come. There, yeah. uh, you, can, you can describe him accurately as negligently or intentionally a mass murderer. And yeah. he is a terrorist. And he is yeah. a stochastic terrorist, and in in the language of the standard issue terrorist who sits in the back and supervises while other people go out and plan right. bombs, kidnap governors, and all the rest of that, he is a terrorist. And the you know not with <clears throat> you don't say it with my God, I just discovered he's a terrorist, but call these people what they are. And I mean, my own experience with doing this is when you say, okay, yeah, the Bush administration is manipulating its terror alerts to gain political advantage for the Republicans anytime there's a Democratic surge in 2004 or in subsequent years. Once you say that, the, the uh, fear that other people have to say the same thing begins to fall away. Right. And so I'm just, because I have a large, thick skull, I'm just the guy who slams his head into the wall first. And usually what you find is, the wall is made out of paper and mm-hmm. nobody's ever checked before. Mm-hmm. So right. that's, that's my job. And, and, and these terms are, these terms are valid. And if, if Mitt doesn't like it, he should have done something more about it or it could do something about it today. You know, for the better part of the pandemic, I have, it, I think I've used the word manslaughter up yeah. until, up until the Woodward book. Yeah. And when the Woodward yeah. tapes were released, when you realize and you hear a different tone in Trump's voice, um, uh, he's still Trump, but um, but you hear him, you hear the, the wheels turning and and he says to he says to Woodward, you know, Bob, this is airborne. Mm-hmm. The media refused to use the word airborne until that tape came out. Yet yeah. it's exactly what it was, but they were afraid to use it because of the, you know, using Trump's thinking the media was afraid of inducing any panic. And so they didn't want to call it airborne that you literally can just get this in the air. Yes. And um, that those tapes went, he went from manslaughter to premeditated murder yes. because he knew, he knew in January it would be his largest 
national security threat ever for him. It, and then early February, he knows that it's uh, uh, it's a real killer. All that stuff between February and March, it's airborne. Bob, this is a plague. This is a plague. He used the word plague. Yes. So he knew. Yeah, and all he, the he like knew. Every, and everything like everything else in his life. The next concern was how does this affect me, and what do I have to do to protect myself, either physically or politically or monetarily, and that's it. There is no. You mean, you've met, we've met lots of people, some of them we agree with politically and some with we disagree, Michael, but they they will often think in those terms. There's a disaster. How does it affect me and my investments? How do I help other people? Well, with Trump, we never get to the how do I help other people because there are no other people in the world to him. This is whatever the problem is that yeah. goes on in that cesspool between his ears. It is about um, it, it, it is fundamentally about the fact that there is a, that there is a Trump and then everything in the world around him is some sort of prop for him to use, mm. uh, attack, uh, use and then attack or ignore. And that's it. There is, we don't exist in his world. There's only him. His family doesn't exist. Right. And you have to start from that point. I mean, this is, this is a case I was making five years ago. And uh, doing, you know, pieces on whether or not he was literally a psychopath, and he he passed the psychopath test with, you know, with room to spare. Right. So, and right. That, that's the origin point of it. And and I think again, when you say these things, and when you when you when you make the statement, and the world does not collapse. Remember, John Kerry told me this in 2007 when I ran into him at the World Series. He said, "Thanks for winning us the House and the Senate last year." I was like, "Come on." He said, "No, no, you were the first one. You were the first one to to say that the terror alerts were being manipulated politically." And I said, "Well, yeah." He said, "Well, that made it possible for the rest of us to say that." I said, "That's not the way it's supposed to work." He goes, "I know, but that's the way it's working now. So thanks for putting your head in, uh, through the wall." He literally used that phrase, and mm. I think, I think so much of this mm. has gone on in large part because people are afraid to be the one out onto the limb first and go, you know, this is yeah. what's actually happening. And the other one is we've had generations of media on both sides that have lived in the shadow of the poisoning of, of political coverage by Rupert Murdoch and Fox News and the New York Post and all the rest of that, the Wall Street Journal editorial board and Rush Limbaugh and everybody else on that side and Hannity and all the rest of these clowns. We've they There are generations who do not know that's not normal who've been seeing Fox News since 1996 and don't know that that is and has always been about two things, about getting their side out and making sure your side does not get out. And to use the real words is to, <clears throat> is to violate what has been established in political commentary and political reporting in the last 25 years, which is most Political reporters, even the neutral ones or the biased ones or the ones who work for Fox, the ones who work for MSNBC or anybody in between, they all mistake a series of facts for the truth. And these are, you know, the facts is not, facts do not equal truth. Facts are a component of truth. You must be able to interpret them in some way and you must be able to put them in the context of a larger picture. And people are terrified to do the latter as if that were not the responsibility of journalism and media and television and, and, and voters. Mm. You know? So, yes. So here we are, we're in the final days of this uh, election. People are already voting by the tens of millions. Yeah. Um, uh, what are you worried about right now? As we, as we now see, we see the end of the tunnel. It's up in front of us here uh, in uh, a week, week and a half. Uh, what, I mean, what is what is really got you seriously worried? Um, you know, you've told us about uh, your fear, justified, uh, considerably justified, that uh, he may not leave. Yeah. But um, what's going on right now? Because of course, the polls all show Biden with a comfortable national lead. They also show that in some of these swing states, it's tightened to yeah. just a few points, which means it could go either way yeah. in Pennsylvania, in Arizona, uh, Florida, the last, um, the, uh, the, the early voting, what they were trying to determine because people have to register um, usually in Florida as a Democrat or Republican or an independent, it was about 50-50 yeah. uh, Democratic and, and Republican. So, so 
you know, I've been trying to tell people, don't take anything for granted here. Don't, Agreed. don't rest for a minute. What's your take? What's your, what's your gut feeling here? Um, as you, you know, speak to the people that are listening to this. I like when I see from the down ballot polling on state levels, in other words, how democratic candidates are doing for the House and the Senate and the governorships that are available and all the rest of that. I like what I'm seeing there, which suggests strong support on a party versus party basis. Um, I like what I mentioned before. I do think one of the things we saw that is that may be useful in trying to figure out what's going to happen this time. At the start of the year, if you remember back that far, the British had an election and the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who is, you know, as, as almost as hollow as Trump is, uh, won his, uh, in, by a large margin, won his parliamentary election and his majority, largely campaigning very subtly and very intelligently on a phrase, get Brexit done, get their, their departure from the European Union done. And I th- heard that and I went, he's going to win, he's going to win by a lot, because what he's saying is, we're all tired of this, let's get it over with. And I think you've even seen Trump has noticed this in the last couple of days when he's talking about COVID. Of course, he's asking people to get tired of something that's about to get much, much worse than it has been for the last three months in places that that had seemingly improved. I work, I'm expecting, you know, we'll start seeing closures in major cities within two weeks um, in COVID-19, obviously. But the idea that there is exhaustion, as I mentioned before, I think is works to Biden's favor. Um, I think the fact that he has kind of Biden's kind of let Trump spin his wheels and throw the, all these sparks out while people are really paying attention has underscored the fact that Trump is exhausting and has put us in peril at every corner. Uh, so I'm, I'm very optimistic about I, uh, the raw kind of outcome. The, my worries are obviously if it's close enough for him to make a serious Trump, that is to make a serious attempt to overturn parts of, of what, wherever, wherever Biden wins uh, in the court, uh, obviously that would be easier with the inclusion of Amy Coney Barrett, who is a right wing nut job being disguised as yeah. you know Mrs. America. I just I, she's Sarah Palin with a better vocabulary from my point of view. There's nothing I saw in there that makes her worthy of being a lawyer, let alone a judge, let alone a justice on the Supreme Court. But the the key to it is this, and I've been saying this for a long time, and people look at me kind of funny, like, well, what do you mean? The the in June there was a succession of statements from the leaders of the US military directed theoretically at their own troops, reminding them that they are to be loyal to the Constitution and not to one person. And this followed the gas at uh, Lafayette Park in Washington. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was very important because it, th- these were signals, these were messages to Donald Trump saying, if you expect your friends in the military, and no matter how much they might agree with you on some of these things, to keep you in power if you lose the election, don't. And I think that, that, I think that thing is off the table. The, the last week has seen, what, six or seven Republican senators criticize Trump in very small, very safe ways. Ben Sass did it. Uh, what's his name from Tennessee? Did it yesterday. Lamar over, Alexander. Yeah, over Fauci. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're not big things, but I think these were also symbolic statements of if you're looking for help in a, in a tight election where you're going to try to stay in office without, you know, without having won anything, don't look to the Republican Party. I think that's largely true. There's going to be diehards who would support him because they are authoritarians and they have no interest in democracy. They want what Karl Rove, we didn't understand what Karl Rove meant when he said the permanent Republican majority, he was talking about a fascist state. So there are those things. And I, but I think the more practical outcome is that we get the first thing that needs to get done, done, which is an electoral victory in two weeks. The problem becomes if it's, even if it's sufficient enough for him to, to have to leave, military is not going to try to keep him in office. His crazy idea that he's begun to spout since last Friday, which was, you know, Biden is, is cannot assume the office of presidency, where you can see a scenario in which Trump says, oh, Biden is guilty of, uh, he caused World War II, or whatever he, whatever crazy ass thing right. up. Right. And he said, therefore, as the president of the United States, I can't possibly let him, for the good of the country, I must stay in office. The Rudy Giuliani idea after 9-11 
Well, right. I know we have the, my term expires on January, but I, we should have an, should have co-mayors for a couple of months. It's like, but yeah, yeah, that's right. If we're in, you know, if we're in uh, uh, fascist Italy in the 1930s, sounds like a good idea, Rudy. But that's, I mean, if all of that goes away, here's the best case scenario, Michael, with a big Biden victory, 350 electoral college votes, clean outcomes in all the states that matter, and maybe unclean ones or doubtful ones when it doesn't make a difference, where there's no chance mathematically of Trump coming back to it. The best case scenario is Trump gets out there on camera and goes, yeah, I lost, I concede, and I'd like to announce I'm running for president in 2024. And that's it. And the idea behind this is, yes, I, there's no, you cannot underestimate the importance of getting him out of power. It is life or death for, I guess the last estimate was 68,000 Americans or 78,000 Americans who would survive, who will not survive between now and January 1st because we're not wearing enough masks. Mm-hmm. So it's literally life and death. That part of it is life and death, but he, they're not going to go away. He and his trailer park trash, racist, scum supporters have been allowed to stop pretending that they're not racist or hateful or sadist or any of that for five years. They're not going to just go away just because he loses an election. He, The one thing about this that you can see he, that comes closest to him having human enjoyment of something. The one thing is those those Bund rallies that he's been holding throughout the, the presidency and in the last campaign. Yeah. He loves that. Yeah. That, I mean, it, with not being bothered with all the president things to just go around the country for the next four years and, and campaign for president again, he loves that. He's going to do that. And these people are not going to go away. So my best case scenario is one where you go, where the election is over. We all go, well, we didn't, the train did not jump the tracks. We did not crash democracy and burn it to, to uh, you know, a cinder. Thank God for that. Okay, everybody get a good eight hours of sleep, and then tomorrow we have to beat these people back into the ground. Because it's, this was the mistake that Barack Obama made, and I did a commentary the night before his inauguration, and never before or since have I taken more heat. And I mean including all the ones about Bush and all the ones about Trump and everything else I've ever said. Mm-hmm. At times I criticized the Dodgers on news radio in Los Angeles in the eighties when I was a local sportscaster. I've never taken such heat as when I said on the night before the inauguration, you have to prosecute the people who broke the laws of this country during the Bush administration. And at minimum, you have to have a, a truth and reconciliation commission and you must address the breaking of the laws relative to torture, or the next Republican president, or maybe a Democratic president, will simply say, yeah, there are laws against this, but nobody's going to do anything about them. So the the most important thing here is a big enough margin of victory that the question of the election is at worst, you know, a couple of days of uncertainty, and then it recedes. But then we, you know, then it's going to have to be, what do we do to, to, take these people out of positions of authority in local governments, police departments, uh, the military. Uh, what do we do with them? How do we, how do we clean up society? And I'm not talking about rounding people up and putting them in camps. I'm not talking about, oh, he said, this is some idiot on the right said, oh, he just called for, for concentration camps for conservatives. It's like, well, okay, maybe that sounds good, but it's not practical and it's also against all my, my beliefs. Uh, that's, that's not what I mean, but we have to, we have to unravel this, this right wing belief that they own the country and the rest of us are just in their way. Mm -hmm. And that's the best case scenario. And that's enough to keep me up at night. The best case scenario is enough to keep me up at night that we immediately go from Trump, the president to Trump, the ex president trying to regain office, like he's some sort of, you know, through the looking glass. LSD driven version of Grover freaking Cleveland mm-hmm. trying to get back into the White House for right. four years of this stuff where he's completely untethered from reality or responsibility. Not or in, he, in, in a way where Nixon came back. He was yeah. vice president. He lost to yeah. Kennedy. Eight, eight years later, he's president. Right. Uh, you won't have at, Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. Right. And seven years later, they're, they're inaugurating him. Well, it's like, boy, we need a bigger steak next time when you, and more garlic. So are, are you concerned about a President Biden who just this week, uh, there, there was a story in the Times or the Post that, um, that the Biden people are considering uh, Republicans to put in the cabinet and that, you know, once in office, 
uh, in the way that Barack Obama, a month after he was elected, yes. uh, named uh, to, uh, uh, Larry Summers and uh, Geithner to run our economy, yeah. uh, the Goldman Sachs boys. And, um, you know, that, that Biden, in the interest of unity and, you know, all the good things that he talks about, will n- not take the necessary measures to create the changes we desperately need right now in this country yep. and just, and, and realize, you know what the American people want right now? Quiet silence, yeah. nothing, you know, I'm going to be Coolidge. I'm just going to be silent. Cal, I'm going to be silent. Joe. And, uh, and Americans will love that after four years of insanity. All right, what, what is your concern uh, and worry uh, uh, about that? Um, well, and I don't lot. bring this, I don't bring this up to, uh, I, I mean, please, everybody, please still vote. Um, it's like, it's uh, not like there's a choice. No, there's no, there's no choice. <laughs> like, oh, we have a choice between what was this? A r- flaming bowls of rat urine versus. But what what, what can you and I? Let's assume yeah. the president Biden, which nobody should do. Yeah. Everybody work in these last uh, days, but what can what can you and I say or do to to alert people rightly alert yeah. them to. Uh, we need to, to push a President Biden uh, in a different direction uh, than the one that um, his beloved friend and mentor uh, chose uh, right after the 08 election. Well, there's two things. One is I would, I would not really trouble him with it for the next two weeks. <laughs> That's, I wouldn't trouble anybody with it for the next okay, two weeks. So, so yeah. everybody just put this on pause right now and now and listen to it two weeks from now. Yeah, but go, I mean, but go ahead. Go ahead. Like, but, but really, I mean, we're, let's, let's cart and horse this thing correctly. I mean, the cart here is, 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 uh, is, is restoring uh, American democracy, which we haven't had for four years. And there have been parts of American democracy we haven't had for 25 years. Let, let's let's deal with that when and and if we get to that point where it, it can be practically dealt with. I mean, there's all there's going to be other things we have to worry about if we don't get to the president elect Biden part. Uh, I am yes. I am hopeful. Like, yeah, like fascism. I am hopeful there will be enough pressure uh, in the in the very process and momentum. I might add that in the very process of unraveling all of these Trumpists in all of these offices. And I don't mind a bunch of Republicans, you know, as Secretary of Transportation or even Housing. A few of the, the those positions, I think that's great. I think when you if you start talking about a Republican Attorney General, I think we then begin to have serious problems. But I I think I mean I know I know Joe Biden a little bit. I haven't talked to him in twelve years, but I, I he once took me to lunch and asked for advice on public speaking, and he said, mm-hmm. "You when you go and do these commentaries," he said, "You you." Uh, you sound forceful and 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 convinced and con- and with your convictions and you are you are righteously indignant. He said, and when I'm angry, people just think I'm crazy. <laughs> and I said, hmm. yes. And yeah. he said, he said, what are, can you give me one or two tips about how to do one or the other? And I looked at him. And I don't know why I said this. I said, you've been in the Senate for how many years? Twenty eight, is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, it's twenty eight. And I said, this is the first time you're asking this question. Now, you and I know this, that if you said that to 99 out of 100 politicians, they'd get up and leave. Biden burst into laughter yeah. at the idea that that was the first time he would have been asking that question and slapped me on the shoulder. And I think there is a decency to this man that he yeah. will entertain what needs to be entertained. And if, if his main task would be to solve, S-A-L-V-E, solve the, the wounds of this country and calm things down, there will be every, everybody around him will be there, you know, ripping out, uh, cleaning the, the proverbial stables and, right. and prosecuting. I, I, I think he's a little less and I, I have great respect. And I think I think Barack Obama he remains a great man. But I but, mm-hmm. uh, but I think he had a much more certainty about his own sort of I'm the president of all the people thing that he could not be talked out of it in any, for any length of time right. by anybody else more than Joe Biden did. There's one thing about being a practical politician and a pragmatist is that if you're surrounded by people who are saying, no, you have to prosecute these people, you may prosecute these people just to be a pragmatist. So I'm, I, yes, I worry about that. I, I, I know that Joe, Joe is thinking, well, you know, Sam Rayburn would have done this. It's like, Oh my God, Sam Rayburn has nothing to do right. with it. But I'm less worried about that 
in retrospect, and I could be wrong, but I'm less worried about that than I was with with, with the president elect Obama, who, mm-hmm. as we both both noticed, did not. It's like, okay, I'm glad you're the president of the people who didn't elect you. Try being president of the people who did elect you. I don't think that distinction will elude Joe as much as it did President Obama. I, I too, have had a couple of encounters with Biden over the years and similar, uh, Keith. And and, and he he actually, it's the damnedest thing, he actually cares about constituents. Yeah, no, he does. For years, it's like 2008, I said he would have been a great Great president. I'm not sure if he would have been a great candidate in 2008 mm. or whatever. And the other, and certainly wasn't in the in the 80s when he tried it. But the but the way he asked you that question, yes. and and that's what I noticed about him privately was asking me questions, then listened, yes, and had a sense of humor about it, yes. and had a humility, yes, about it. Because I had thought the same thing. Why are you asking me? I mean, I'm not that I, right. I'm glad you're asking, but you know, but it's it it was like, huh. It just stuck with me, just like it stuck. That lunch stuck with you there. I think that 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 uh, gives a lot of. I hope, think realistic hope. I hope. I hope. I hope. I hope. I hope. But so in, um, we got to go here. But I just, I, I final thoughts um, here in these final days, especially people listening to this. They're writing me, they're leaving me voicemails on on the podcast uh, platform here. What can I do? What can I do? What should I do? I don't know what to do. And um, I'm just curious what, if you were, uh, and you are a, a field organizer um, and, and, and you do this uh, every day at uh, five o'clock on YouTube, but now you're speaking directly to people who, as soon as we're done, they want to get up and go do something, mm-hmm. something to contribute over this next week or so. What, what do you, Keith Oberman, say to them? Well, you know, I, I, the simplest thing, the thing that you can do right now without even getting up and, and getting a glass of water is to is to forward this podcast to somebody or 100 people or send it out in your social media or my videos or any of the other videos or any of the Biden videos to keep the, 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 the intensity of this last two weeks uh, at least equal on the side to Trump's you know, out of control fire hose and his supporters who were all out of control fire hoses and this whirlwind that they create. The simplest, most direct thing you can do with literally 90 seconds of investment is to retweet this podcast or tweet this podcast or send it out on Facebook because um, you, the, the, if you can't, you feel like you can't do anything, the simple act of of spreading the word is, it's been used by religions, it's been used by dictators, it can also be used by people who are fighting for American democracy. And that is what you are doing. And if there are more things that you can do in terms of volunteering, in terms of getting people to make sure who, who can't go to the polls because of the pandemic or their own health, if you can get them, make sure they have voted, that's great. If you can volunteer in some way locally, that's great. If you can uh, poll watch in some way, that's great. But if you can't do any of those things, the simple act of, as stupid as it sounds, social media actually works. And it actually has an influence. And these, these, you know, the, the easiest way to defeat falsehood is to amplify truth. So go do that. Yes. And, and all of you listen to this. You've got 10 followers. You've got 100 followers. Yep. You may have more. Uh, don't underestimate uh, the importance of you on a daily basis right now, posting your thoughts, uh, reminding people where the polling sites are, how people can find out where they are. Uh, encouraging them to not give up. Uh, the lines could be long. That's okay. It's our country. All of that, Keith, I think uh, what you yeah. just said is, is, is spot on. And um, wear a mask. And wear a mask, please, please. We're we've got to get through. Yeah. We've got to get through this virus. Yeah. Um, all right. So you've got to go uh, do your show for today. Yes. All right. Keith Oberman, um, thank you so much. Thank you for coming back into the fray. Uh, five o'clock uh, Eastern. Uh, every uh, afternoon, if you're working or you're doing something else, then you can listen to it later. It's on YouTube. It's on the Keith Olbermann YouTube channel. Um, I'm watching it every day. Uh, it's quick. It's 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 intense. It's uh, it's just the it's just the five hour energy drink <laughs> that you need. And Michael, there's now an American flag in the corner because I wanted to bring that back to the right side of things. Good for you. <laughs> thank thank you. Right. Thank you so much. All the best. All right. Take care, Keith. Be well.
Well, that was great uh, to talk to Keith there. A bit before we go any further, and I just have another, just a little bit more of your time. I want to just go over a couple things with you. So, so stick with me here. But I, I also want to thank our other underwriter for today's episode. If I can just take a second to do that, it's Raycon. Uh, they have been with us now for a few months. Uh, Raycon, of course, makes those great wireless earbuds, high quality, but unlike the other earbuds, half the price. So these were invented by the great songwriter and rapper uh, Ray J. And of course, he's got Snoop Dogg and uh, Melissa Etheridge and a bunch of others uh, using them. I love them. Earlier, I had them in because I was filling out my ballot. Uh, for the election, my absentee ballot. And I was filling that out and I wanted to listen to some music. And so I put on uh, Demi Lovato's a new single, a Commander in Chief. And I also was listening to a, a new um, a new single by uh, Jackson Brown. It's called uh, a, a Little Too Soon to Say. Of course, I've loved Jackson Brown forever and Demi Lovato. So anyways, that's what I was using my Ray J earbuds for. Now, they've got a new model called Everyday E25 earbuds. You get six hours of playtime with them. Uh, it's got more bass. Megan Trainer will like that. And uh, it's very compact design, very easy to carry around. And it's amazing, too, how it just cuts out all the other noise that's around or in the room or whatever. So give them a try. All you got to do is, you know, go on there on their website. You just go on to buy Raycon. Now, when I say buy, I don't mean B-Y. I mean B-U-Y. <laughs> Buyraycon.com slash rumble. Okay. That's all you got to do. That will help this podcast keep going. So buy B-U-Y, buy Raycon, not com, Raycon, R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash rumble. Uh, Rumble, and you can get a 45-day free return policy uh, if you decide to get their earbuds. Also, I should probably point this out. They told me that that anybody who who does this uh, today, tomorrow, whatever, who contacts them with slash Rumble, you can get a 15% discount on their wireless earbuds. Won't give up, stand your ground. We'll be on the streets while you're bunkering down. Won't give up, stand our ground We'll be in the streets for your commander-in-chief Honestly, if I did the things you do Okay, so most of you are going to be listening to this on Thursday and uh, 12 days away from the election. And of course, uh, the debate is uh, tonight, Thursday night. The debate, so I'm still assuming that Trump will show up, but anything could happen as we know. Uh, they say they've got a mute button in place. Um, I don't believe that anything can stop Trump. Uh, he is uh, stronger than any mute button. So you will have to prepare yourself for another version of of insane Trump, but this time insane Trump on drugs. So I hate to say we want to tune in just for the entertainment value because things are way too serious right now. And thousands, thousands, 60,000 plus a day now are coming down with coronavirus. More and more people are dying. This is just awful. Um, it, it's too bad there. Our system doesn't work well enough to just have removed him by now. Just friggin' remove him. We've had to listen to Trump for the last week or so, calling Joe Biden a criminal every time he gets a chance. He wants him arrested. He's told Bill Barr to arrest him. He's upset at Bill Barr for not arresting him. He wants... He wants Biden arrested. He wants his son arrested. He he wants Hillary arrested. He wants Obama arrested. This guy is out of control. But you know, but again, you can't just laugh at this. You can't treat it as entertainment because he's constantly telegraphing what he's going to do, what he wants to do and hopes to do. And most of the time, he's been able to pull it off. So I don't put it past him one single bit to try to figure out a way to literally arrest his opponent on the ballot, the former vice president of the United States, have him arrested sometime in the next 12 days. I want you to think about this too. I want you to imagine this. I know, I know your stomach is already upset enough. We're all on pins and needles. It's just, it was, but you've got to, you've got to wrap your head around this because when it happens, there needs to be an outcry, the likes of which have not been heard in quite some time. Imagine you're, you're you've got, cable news on 
you're listening to the radio, you've got your iPhone beside you, and boom, all of a sudden there's a blast, a blast of real breaking news, not the kind of everything's breaking news on cable news, but this is real breaking news. This is a news flash. They've interrupted everything and everybody to tell the American public that at 4 o'clock today, 4 p.m., the former vice president of the United States, Joe Biden, and his son, Hunter, were arrested by the United States Department of Justice. They've been taken into custody along with Biden's wife, Jill. Imagine hearing this. Don't think you won't hear it or something like it in these next 12 days. You know it. That's why we're all so freaked out to try and get through this. But we've got to, we've got to deal with it. At 4 p.m. today, the former vice president of the United States, Joe Biden, was arrested by the United States Department of Justice. Federal marshals took him away. We understand that at first the FBI was ordered to do it, but they refused. So Trump and Bill Barr sent in the federal marshals and arrested former Vice President Joe Biden, his son Hunter, and they've taken into custody Biden's wife, Jill Biden. Lump in the throat? Heart racing? With Trump, you know this by now, after these four years, you must plan for the worst. I know, hope for the best, right? But in his case, you definitely have to plan for the worst. So what's our plan? What's our plan? All the, every rally, lock him up, lock him up in Michigan for the governor. There, lock her up, lock her up. She's the victim of a heinous crime where they were planning to kidnap and kill her. Lock her up. You know, it's one thing when candidate Trump four years ago was leading chants like this. It's another thing when you're the president of the United States, you are the boss of the Justice Department. You are the boss of the prison system. And in his mind, he not only knows that, believes he can do anything he wants with it. And what do we know? He will do it. He doesn't just talk about this stuff. He actually tries to do it. Now, I'm not saying absolutely positively sure this is going to happen. It may be something else I can't even think of. But he will do something. And I think because he has not let go of this and now he's criticized Barr publicly for why hasn't, why hasn't Biden been arrested yet? He keeps asking. Somebody is going to obey the commander in chief. And now here, now we have footage. Now we have, here's the video. It's just come in. Vice President Joe Biden in handcuffs along with his son Hunter. And they are taking, where are they taking them? They're taking, they're, they're, they're going to the federal. Yes, the, right. Most federal buildings have some form of jail cell in case the FBI or federal marshals need to arrest somebody. They can hold them there on federal property. And that's what they're doing. That's what we're seeing right now on TV. Okay. I'll stop. Or oh, I know this is <laughs> Mike. You're freaking us out. I'm freaking you out. We've had a collective freak out for four years. Tell me right now, you don't think this could happen. Be honest. Are you still one of the believers that it just can't get that bad? Trump isn't that bad? No. 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 Now we understand nobody knows where they've taken him. No, We thought it was the federal building in Wilmington, but now they're saying they've taken him to Philadelphia. And other reports are coming in saying they've taken him to, D- to D.C. This is the presidential candidate that's on the ballot right now. 30 plus million people have voted. And we don't know where he is. Because he's been taken away by Trump's federal marshals. <sighs> okay, okay, I'll stop, I'll stop, I'll stop. But you know it, and I know it. We've lived through enough of this, and it's better to be prepared and have a plan. Not just a plan of how you're going to vote, if you haven't voted yet, but a plan for how we're going to stop what he's doing to Biden. And you know, if you follow Trump's patterns here, this doesn't mean that in another day or two, 
Biden is released or whatever. Because remember, the purpose of these images and the purpose of Trump trying to commit an act like this is to fire up his already vastly fired up base. They're so hot and, and, and excited over Trump. The fact that, that Trump would actually arrest a Democrat, the Democratic pre- candidate for president. Oh my God. Every single one of them, his supporters, they're not only going to vote, they're going to bring a lot of people with them to the polls. This is, this is something they could only in their wildest dreams hope could happen to see Trump having handcuffs on the Democrat who's running for president. Wait, what's that? Okay. Now <laughs> this can't be, this can't be true. We're now getting word that federal marshals are outside the home of Hillary Clinton in Chappaqua, New York. They, I, right? Okay, we don't, we haven't seen any, they, but, they, but they've essentially surrounded her house with federal marshal SUVs, these black SUVs. What the hell is going on? Yes, I know he said he was going to arrest her. I know he said he was going to lock her up, but I just, I mean, wasn't that just rhetoric? Wasn't that just campaign rally craziness from him? Okay. Sorry. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to prime the pump there. If you're just <laughs> tuning into this in real life, not yet, at least he's not locked her up. Our first woman president, the woman who won, the woman who won in 2016 by 3 million votes. Hmm. I'm on the edge of my seat. I don't trust him for an inch. And because he's such he's such a showman, he understands the power of the visual image. 14 seasons on NBC in prime time. As I've said, I only had four seasons. <laughs> Seinfeld had what, nine? Friends had 11 seasons? Trump, 14. Mm -hmm. Don't think he doesn't know how to do this. And you're not his audience, most of you. You're not his audience. He knows who his audience is. All he's got to do is get just a few, just a couple million of those hundred million who are the non-voters, people who usually don't vote. And through his antics this week, next week, he convinces them to get out there for him. Don't think this can't happen. Don't. Don't put your trust in these polls. Don't put your trust in the media telling you, oh, look at all this. Look at these long lines. Well, oh, yeah, it must be mostly Democrats until last night. <laughs> CNN or whatever had, had on. Well, actually, in Florida, because I think you have to register by party there. So they know um, at least how many Democrats or Republicans have come out. And it was something like 150,000 ballots to 150,000 ballots. Half and half, Democrat, Republican, extremely close. Just a few hundred votes apart of those who voted already. This thing is closer than what they're telling us. And likewise, in two weeks, if we all do our work and if we all get more people to the polls, it could be that tsunami that I've prayed for. A tsunami of ballots that buries Donald J. Trump. It could be that too. But why are we taking any chance, any risk whatsoever? No. What? Uh, uh, I can't. I'm not going to believe this. I cannot believe this. They, okay, they have filed some sort of, they don't want to go to, oh my God, they don't want to go to Obama's house in D.C., I guess maybe that's just a bridge too far, but they have filed papers. They've filed papers with a federal prosecutor to have Obama arrested. But they're going to let him turn himself in so that they don't have a big a scene of going there and putting him in handcuffs. This is, I cannot, my friends, you said this wouldn't happen. All right, I'll, I'll, I will stop right there. Don't think for a second that something like this couldn't go on in the next 12 days. Unless you want to make the case for me that Trump is sane and 
in love with our democracy? Okay. Other than that, though, assuming you can't convince me of that, he's capable of anything. So finally, a lot of you have been asking me, thank you, by the way, those of you who've been sending me emails, I'd love to hear from any of you, uh, any ideas you have, mike at michaelmoore.com. Any questions you have of me, mike at michaelmoore.com. It's that easy. Um, I read all my mail and um, and I listen to my voice messages. So if you want to leave me a voicemail, there's a link right here on the podcast page here of the platform you're listening to me on. Just look for the details of this episode and scroll all the way down and you'll see a link uh, for you to click and it and on dials up my number and it gives you a minute to ask me a question, to make a statement. Um, a number of people, a number of women in the last week have been leaving their story about back when abortion was illegal and what they went through um, or what it's like now when they've, they've frightened doctors in many states to not perform them. It's very hard to get one when you want one now. Um, so leave me, leave me a voicemail message. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry it just goes for 60 seconds, um, but that's just so it can accommodate everybody who wants to say something. So anyways, a lot of you have been writing me and saying, what can I do? Mike, what can I do? What can I do? Two weeks left. What can I do? It's less than two weeks now. What can I do? Um, let me just tell you something. Um, obviously, you know, you can contact the local Democratic Party. You can talk, contact the Biden campaign. You can do, you know, go online and, and find out. There, there's people are doing phone banks from home. Um, there's different groups doing different things. You can, you can get involved in, in all of that. Thank you to all of you, by the way, who joined in the Swing Left event uh, with myself and uh, Billy Joe Armstrong uh, from Green Day last, um, last Friday night. Um, thousands, thousands of people participated in this. I think uh, we wrote numbers. I saw it was almost like a half a million people had written five letters, 10 letters or whatever to people to get them out to vote. So thank you, all of you who did that last week. But everybody listening to this, you can do this on your own. Uh, let me, I want to, can I just, this is what I want to do for this weekend. Um. There are three things that everybody can do, and you can do this without having to join an organization or any of this stuff. You can just do this on your own. Do not wait for anybody to do this for you. You can do this. You have the power as a citizen to do certain things. You have rights. You can you can take a stand. You can involve your family and your friends. You know, you have to be, I mean, it's, we're, in a, we're in a pandemic, so you have to be very careful about this. But let me just give you three things, three easy things that you can do this weekend. And in fact, maybe just do one each day. Make it simple. Make it easy on yourself. So I'm going to give you for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, something you can do for each day. So on Friday, on Friday, make a Biden sign, Biden-Harris. Make a Biden sign. <clears throat> don't try to figure out where you can get one at this point. Just make your own. Plus, the homemade signs always look great. You're driving down the road. You see that somebody put the effort into this. They believe so strongly in the candidate. You just need a, 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 a some poster board. Uh, if you go to Staples, safely do that, buy that, or just o open up a box, a cardboard box, and flatten it out. Make a sign out of that. You can make a sign. You've got materials to make a sign. You need a black felt pen or, you know, uh, 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 something that doesn't, you know, won't in the rain just drip off the thing. So you want the permanent ink kind if you've got that, but all you've got to do is get that, get the kids, get this and make a sign, make two signs. How do you put it in your yard? I don't know. Staple it onto a yardstick, put it on a yard, put, put, you've got something you can staple it onto and go out and stick it in your yard. Or if you live in an apartment building, put it in your window. Put in your window. Let people when they go down the street and they look by, go by that apartment building. I'm just look, it's like Biden, 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 Biden. Whoa! Let's get people fired up. Sometimes it's just that seeing that your neighbors and your the people in your community. Wow, I didn't know that many people were for Biden. Now oh, this feels good. Maybe I should maybe I should join in and do something. So Friday is sign making day. Make that sign. Put it in your window. Put it in the yard. All it's got to say is Biden. 
If you got room, put Biden Harris. That's all. Nothing fancy or make it fancy. Be creative. Involve the family in the project and do this. On Saturday, what I'd suggest for Saturday is spend a couple of hours on Saturday um, in your address book on your phone and go through and text or email or call and text or email people you know and just remind them, you know, there's early voting in 45 states. You can find out what's going on in your state, where to vote by going to IWillVote.com. But just tell, tell them, remind them, hey, have you voted yet? Are you going to vote on the 3rd? I just, wanted to, I just wanted to say this is such a great moment for this country, and I'm hoping that you'll vote for Biden and, and just, you know, whatever. You'll know, you'll know what to say. Or think of that one person in your extended family or a friend or a classmate, a person you know that probably doesn't usually vote what we call a non-voter and reach out to them. Don't vote shame them. Don't tell them they must do this. Many of them have made a decision to check out of a very corrupt system that is anything but democratic. And so they have their act of civil disobedience that they commit on election day by refusing to participate in a system that is not what it says that it is. And you have to understand that, yeah, you get it. You understand. Tell them that. And ask them for just this one time, just this once, for me, for all of us, just if you would do this. And if it doesn't work and it just ends up being just a pile of shit, don't do it again. Go back to being a non-voter. But just maybe just this one time, you want to go with me? Oh, or I'll, I've already voted, but I'll go with you. You know, make it, a, make it a fun thing. Make it lunch. Make it getting a beer afterwards. I don't know. Whatever it is that feels right and human. My friends, if you convince just one person who's planning not to vote to vote and vote for Biden-Harris, just one person, that means you've doubled your vote. You've automatically doubled your vote. You voted for Biden, and now you've just convinced somebody who wasn't going to vote to vote for Biden. Wow. That's pretty heavy if you think about it. You, like in an instant, can double your vote. And if everybody did that, if we could actually double every vote for Biden, well, we wouldn't have to worry about anything, I think. Well, I shouldn't say that. We're always going to worry till, till he's been permanently encased at Mar-a-Lago. Do that on Saturday. Make that the Saturday project. Call people, text them, email them, tell them why you're voting for Biden. And maybe convince one non-voter or adopt, adopt a non-voter that's in your family and make, make him or her your project for the next 12 days. Your democratic democracy project. On Sunday, on Sunday, I want to suggest something, and you have to be careful with this because we're in a pandemic and we have to be safe. Everybody has to be safe. Um, but what if you just did a walk through your neighborhood? What if you were to go and just and knock on your neighbor's doors and then step back? You know, they're going to look out to see who's there. Step back so you're, they can see you're a good six to 10 feet away from them. Wear your mask. Wear some eyewear. Um, wear gloves. Be really safe here. And they open the door. They may not open the screen door. They may open. They may. They may be glass encased already. Uh, they'll recognize you. You're the neighbor. Just say, "Hey, I'm sorry to bother you. I want to keep our distance here. I just wanted to tell you. I just. I'm. I'm so worried about this country, and I'm. And and I know we can do better." And none of us are better off than we were four years ago. And so however, however you voted, you know, he had his chance and we need, we need a change. We need a change right now. And um, so, uh, you know, please, please vote for Biden if you haven't voted already. 
And now you're thinking, oh, geez, I don't want to do this. And half the neighborhood might be Trump people. Now they're going to know where I am. And you have to be brave, my friends. There can't be any whining here. Okay. You've got to really just tell people, let them see you as a human being. Uh, bring the family with you. Keep your distance. Everybody masks, gloves, eyewear. Be loving. Be friendly. If you live in an apartment building, do it just on the doors on the people on your floor and step back so they'll open they may not open the door but maybe you can talk to them through the door do it safely one-on-one human contact when there's an election is the best thing just like word of mouth when people go to the movies it's the best thing no amount of advertising can beat that Show up. Let them see you. Let them see that you are doing this. You are doing this. You're being present, and you want them to join you as your neighbor. That's the Sunday job. Friday, make a sign. Saturday, text, email, or call friends and family to make sure they're voting and adopt a non-voter that you know. Get them to vote. Double your vote. And Sunday, take a stroll through the neighborhood, through the apartment building safely and encourage people to vote. That's it. That's it. Anybody can do that. You don't need any money. You don't need to be part of any organization. You can call organizations and do that. But I'm saying that you can actually do this on your own. That's it today, uh, my friends. I'll be back here shortly, um, soon, um, because there's a lot going on and we need to be on top of all of this um, I thank Keith Oberman uh, for coming on the podcast here today I thank you for listening I thank you for what you're going to do this weekend uh, to help uh, get out the vote and, and in advance I thank you for making sure that we all have a plan should Trump pull any any criminal activity over these next 12 days we can do this. We can do this. We hold the power. There's more of us than there are of them. Never forget that. And Republicans who are going to support the Supreme Court nomination are going to go down. That, I assure you, they are not all going to make it. Some of them will. Some of them will. They'll have, they'll have to answer for it someday. But we're going to flip this Senate. We're going to get this control in our hands. We have no choice, my friends. That's it for Rubble today. I'm Michael Moore. Be well. We were taught when we were young. If we fight for what's right, there won't be justice for just some. Won't give up.